I want you to hear exactly where this goes. Okay. So, but as far as you're concerned, this doesn't, I mean, I think Paul's concern is that by there being worlds which are not feasible for God to choose, that somehow undermines God's sovereignty because then it's suggesting God. Well, it weakens, it weakens. So, you see, the emphasis is now not on God's choosing me because he wanted me to be his child Mm -hmm. eternally and unconditionally and by his grace, Uh, but he's chosen a world. Okay. Okay. And I happen to be part of that world. So you're sort of, you're, a byproduct I'm of a, a kind world of, where, kind where he's of, trying to get maximise the most number, say, of people. Well, whatever his him. whatever his conditions of feasibility are, there are certain worlds that are ruled out. We, we, that, that's clear. But what, but coming as it were closer to the centre, what the conditions of feasibility are seems to me we, we couldn't possibly be, be clear on. It's, mm. it's, that would have to remain remain a mystery. Nonetheless, his love for me is not, as it were, direct and personal. It's because. I'm falling part of a world which is the, the world which, which overall. He he wants it. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't see that at all. I wouldn't agree with that at all. God loves each individual and wants that person to be saved, and He will choose to create a world of individuals. So it, the world isn't primary. The individuals are primary, and then they build together a kind of world mm-hmm. as you accumulate individuals. But now. The key statement is about to be uttered, but, but, I want to chime in there and point out that uh, I believe Dr. Helm was right. And when Dr. Craig says, I I just don't see that at all, then he needs to hear more carefully what's being said. Paul Helm is saying, in light of what, of the statement that God's decree is based upon middle knowledge, this middle knowledge does not come from God's will, that does not come from God's heart, does not come from God's desires. It just is. And the idea being that God envisions all feasible worlds, but actuates a world based upon some choice he has made, which is nowhere, of course, discussed in Scripture. We have no way of knowing what it is. It's pure speculation no matter what we do. But let's say it's maximum number of people saved with minimum amount of evil. That means that there are not only individuals who cannot be saved, but that your role in that, if you are a saved person, your role in that is just you fit into that algorithm. And there might be other potential people who will never be created because they don't fit into how God wants to accomplish that. But their existence in middle knowledge is just as real as your existence in middle knowledge was before the decree. And so it is true that this means that the specificity of election, of divine election in Reformed theology, cannot be a part of the Molinistic scheme at all. Because the only way you can say that is, well, yeah, you can still have an elect, but they're elect because they were the ones that would fit into the scheme. And that's totally different than being, they're the ones that God changed by his resurrection power. Right? So, I get exactly what is being said there. So, but here's, ding, ding, ding. If you've struggled with Molinism, here it is. As you accumulate individuals, but what the Molinist does say that I think the Calvinist finds objectionable is that God is not in control of which subjunctive conditionals are true. Okay. He doesn't determine the truth value of these subjunctive conditionals. That's outside his control, and the Calvinist finds that objectionable. All right, so we are going to zero in on that in just a second. I wanted you to hear it. Let me repeat it. What the Molinist does say, that the Calvinist does find objectionable, is that God is not in control of what subjunctive conditionals are true. He doesn't determine the truth value of these subjunctive conditionals. That's outside his control. All right. What are subjunctive conditionals? That's what makes up middle knowledge. That's what Peter would do in this circumstance. That's the subjunctive conditional. And what he's saying is God has no control over that. 
So who did? The man can't because it doesn't exist yet. This is where the whole, and this is what I was accused. You've misrepresented William Lane Craig. No, I haven't. This is where the card dealer comes in. God's got to deal with the cards he's been dealt. What are the cards he's been dealt? They're subjunctive conditionals. He didn't control them. He didn't define them. But they're true anyways, and they determine what he can do. Okay, so I want you to hear this last section. I, I mean, the whole notion of middle knowledge, as portrayed by uh, Bill, is objectionable to the Calvinists. As I said at the beginning, uh, he can, as it were, shunt, shunt all this stuff off into one or other of God's other two uh, sources of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I, I think that's been a very helpful distinction to have at the end, actually, in terms of a, a real kind of yeah point at which... This obviously breaks in terms of the view of God um, for, a, for a Molinist and a Calvinist. Um, I think Justin found that to be useful as well. That's what he just said. It, it, that's where the, the, the distinction is to be found. And this is, as far as I can tell, this is the key, once again. What the Molinist does say that I think the Calvinist finds objectionable is that God is not in control of which subjunctive conditionals are true. Okay. He doesn't determine the truth value of these subjunctive conditionals. That's outside his control. That's outside his control. So here's the issue. If you've struggled, if you've just sort of put off the side, this is, I think, the clearest statement that I've found so far. <laughs> subjunctive conditionals are those statements that say in this situation, Peter would deny Christ. In this situation, you will turn right, not left. You will choose this person to marry and not that person to marry. These are subjunctive conditionals, and they have, as it said, truth value. They are true. But God's not in control of those subjunctive conditionals. He doesn't determine the truth value of these subjunctive conditionals. That's outside his control. That's outside his control. And these subjunctive conditionals do not arise from his decree to create. Now, if you say, well, but if they're about creatures, then they have to arise from God's creative power, because no creature exists apart from God's creative power. And I would say, of course, that's why theologians up to Melina did not have a middle knowledge. They did not see any need for a middle knowledge. See, middle knowledge envisions mankind as these entities that exist outside of their context. And we don't exist that way. The decisions that I make or that you make are influenced by any myriad of things. I don't exist as some subjunctive conditional. I exist as the son of a particular set of parents and a particular set of grandparents with a particular siblings and certain neighbors in a certain culture, speaking a certain language at a certain time in history. And every single one of those things is an influence upon the decisions that I make. And every single one of those things might make it impossible to know what decisions I will make. Sometimes I surprise myself. And I'm pretty predictable. I mean, it wouldn't be too difficult for, for someone to predict where I'm going to go. But there are sometimes I surprise myself and everybody else in the process. But that can't happen if you have true subjunctive conditional knowledge of whatever I would do in any given situation. And you and I both know that you've been placed in the exact same situation and done different things. Sometimes two, three, four, five different things in the same situation. So the idea that there is only one thing you would do, I challenge that that it results in any meaningful idea of human freedom at all. I mean, any Molinist who will use the old canard that we believe that 
human beings are just puppets. But then we'll turn around and say that there is a truth value to subjunctive conditionals that means you will always do the same thing in a given circumstance. <laughs> Look in the mirror. You're the one with the puppet, not me. So, uh, you have to keep all these things in mind that we are complex beings. Here's the next thing. Molinists, as a group, have a very weak anthropology and a very weak doctrine of depravity and sin. And very often, you will hear them decrying the uh, reformed understanding of man's deadness and sin, man's slavery to sin, and all the associated things that go along with that. And there's a reason for that, because think about it. If you have the example that Dr. Craig uses in his book is you have middle knowledge, true subjunctive conditional about Peter denying Christ. Was Peter's denial of Christ sinful? Was Peter a fallen person? What is the relationship between middle knowledge and the federal headship of Adam? If federal headship is true, and Romans chapter 5 says it is, and if we are in Adam and fall in Adam, that means, as Romans chapter 8 says, that we cannot even submit ourselves to the law of God, do what is pleasing in God's sight. That means there's a whole realm of possible choices that are precluded. We can't do those things, but then when we're regenerated, we can. How does middle knowledge deal with that? How can you have truth value to subjunctive conditional statements about one human being that is true both when he's unregenerate and when he then is regenerate. Because the point of regeneration in their theology is up to the individual, right? So, wouldn't middle knowledge change dependent upon the actions of the individual? So that now there are choices available to the regenerate person that were not available to the unregenerate person? How, how do you have, from whence derives this middle knowledge, in light of the doctrine of original sin, the federal headship of Adam, and the doctrine of regeneration? Now remember, the guy that dreamed this up was Roman Catholic. And so there are gaping holes in his soteriology. There are gaping holes in his scripturology, in his sources of authority. So how do you make that work? I don't know. But it, obviously, what I'm saying is, a recognition of God's absolute sovereignty and freedom in the election of an undeserving people, not based upon something that literally exists outside of God. If it's outside of his control, that's outside his control. But since the human beings don't exist yet, it's outside their control because they haven't been put into that circumstance, because the circumstances are depend upon the decree of God. <laughs> See what happens when you start trying and, and really, uh, when you listen to the Molinists, most of them will admit and will recognize that when they talk about scripture, their only goal is to say that Molinism can be made amenable to, consistent to, not completely contradictory to, 
scriptural statements, not that it derives its essence from scripture. In fact, I think most Molinists, honestly, if they were just to be straight up honest with us, would say, these are not issues that can be addressed scripturally. Scripture just does not address this stuff. And that's where I say, oh, but it does. <laughs> oh, but it does. And so if you would start with the decree of God, if you would start by asking yourself the question, um, all right, I will tell of the decree of Yahweh, is what the psalmist says. What decree of Yahweh? And once you dive into that biblically, it involves God's freely expressing his desire to glorify himself in how he works in human history. So God specifically chose Joseph to function in the role that he did in bringing the people into bondage in slavery in Egypt. And to save that line, the line that he had promised Abraham would be the line through which the Messiah would come. He saved that line by putting them in slavery in Egypt. He glorified himself in that fashion. That's his decree. He's working that out. It's not that, well, that's the feasible world where those individuals, and it's a limited number of individuals when you think about it, you know, God's choices would be extremely limited once you factor in prophecy. Because once God makes promises through Abraham, the only feasible worlds that God can create are the ones where that line that has now been prophesied is maintained. Do you have any idea how many lines of, in human history have been wiped out by all sorts of things? War and famine and flood and disease and everything else? Well, he's in control of all those things because in Molinism, he controls every single aspect of everything. It is absolute, complete providential control of every circumstance. Why? So that mankind will only freely do what he does. Of course, he will only freely do what he does because God puts him in the situation knowing what he's going to do. The vast majority of people who are advocates of autonomy find that to be an extremely shallow version of autonomy. I'm sorry? Oh, it's a totally stacked deck. Of course it is. Um, but, be it as it may, the point is, once you have prophecy functioning, the number of worlds is constricted greatly because you have to make sure that that one line, that one family continues on. And God was utterly free to do that in the way that he chose to do so to glorify himself. And isn't it interesting, the plagues on Egypt were plagues that demonstrated the supremacy of Yahweh over the gods of Egypt. And that was purposeful. That was God expressing his eudakia, his, the kind intention of his will. But in Molinism, that was just the best feasible way of making that happen. And there might have been other feasible ways, but it wouldn't fit the algorithm of most saved and we don't know. It's all guesses. It's completely guesses. But, see, Molinism exists out here. It is a philosophical construct. It is not derived from Scripture. The, the only attempt is to make it, try to make it seem consistent with Scripture, but, it, but no one can really argue that Molina was studying the Bible and came up with this, this type of stuff. Molina was studying the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and the teachings of the Reformers and he was under command to find a way to shortcut the Reformation. That's where this came from. And so it exists out here. 
And once you try to, and I think this is why most Molinists don't even bother. They do a couple of verses and say, see, it's not contradictory. We could view it in this way, but it's not, this isn't really where it comes from, but it's, it has great theological value and insight. That's the statement. That's, that, that's what's being said. Because they recognize if you really try to make this fit and put it into biblical history and use it in that way, the result is a complete catastrophe because it doesn't work. And for most of them, it's, it's hidden. That's where it wasn't hidden. That's where it was straightforward. But that's the necessary assertion. In mere Molinism, it's still there. As long as you assert that middle knowledge exists and you define it as true subjunctive conditionals that are not determined by God. You may even not even get there, may not even use that language, but if that's what you mean by middle knowledge, then you're stuck with it. There's no place for you to go. Well, it was William Lane Craig that was right. What the Molinist does say that I think the Calvinist finds objectionable. Bingo. Thank you, Bill. That's exactly the point.